Yep. Well, we're at 7.01 I've got on my clock. So I think we'll go ahead and get started here, Jen, if that works for you. Sure. Um, so to those who have those who have logged on, go ahead and in the chat, if you would, introduce yourself. Um, you can see us, but we can't see you. So just go ahead and put your name, uh, okay. where, you're, where you're from, and what you teach. Uh, I'm assuming most people are teaching choir or show choir, but still we might want to know the grades as well. That would um, be helpful, yeah. And so go ahead and put that information in the chat for us, if you would. And, uh, and then just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this. So uh, if you wanna go back and review the video or, uh, or if you know someone who wasn't able to catch it tonight, we're gonna put it on our Facebook and YouTube pages um, after the fact. And uh, we are also offering a, a promo code, which I wanna mention uh, for the book, The Art of Competitive Show Choir by Jen. Uh, and uh, I'll put this all in the chat, but that promo code is gonna be Show Choir 15. And that's for 15% off the book through October 1st. So we have a month and a half to use that promo code. Awesome. Uh, and then I, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the, uh, the agenda, we'll, we'll spend about the first 45 minutes here with Jen uh, talking to us. And then we'll save the last 15 minutes or so for a Q&A segment. Uh, and so if you do come up with any questions throughout the course of the webinar, there's a little section down at the bottom uh, of your screen called Q&A. And that's a great place to put um, any questions you have, and I'll kind of keep track of that, and then I'll field those questions to Jen at the end. Uh, and then I think I need to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brian Gibson, and I'm one of the editors here at GIA Publications. We published Yay. Jen's wonderful book just about a year ago, almost exactly we last did. summer. And, uh, and I, I had the pleasure of being the editor on that book. Um, so I did, I did, show choir. <laughs> I, thank you. I did, I did show choir throughout my time in high school and um, continue to arrange some for show choir as well. Uh, so very much uh, familiar with the show choir world and love it uh, and very excited to hear what Jen has to share tonight. So let me just give a quick introduction for Jen and then we'll go ahead and get started. So Jen Randall has nearly 20 years of experience as a show choir uh, director in uh, as a choir and show choir director in the Midwest and Texas, where she started the state's first competitive show choir, which is Hard to believe that they didn't have one in Texas prior to you getting down there. Truly so. not. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and she currently travels the country doing clinic and consulting work for show choirs with her company, Show Collective. And as I already mentioned, she uh, wrote an excellent book with us uh, that we published last summer called The Art of Competitive Show Choir. And uh, with that, I want to turn things over to, to Jen. And I see we have some people in the chat telling us where they teach and uh, yes. where they're located. Keep doing that. That's good for me to see so I can help tailor it to you and your ages and all that stuff. Um, if you want to throw in the chat also, if you just want to say like if you are, and I know some of you have already done this, but just add in, you can say like if you're very new to show choir, like you don't have one at all and you're new, you can just say new. And if you have one currently and you're just looking for more information to kind of, you know, take it up to the next level, let's say, um, you can say something. You could say old. No, I'm just kidding. Don't say old. <laughs> you could just say I have one or Yes, I'm already doing one. That's fine too. So, um, but yeah, it's nice to have all of you. I was saying to Brian and uh, Alec was on with us earlier that today was actually my first day of school. And like three months ago, Jen was like, yeah, let's do a webinar the first day of school at 7 p.m. And then today, Jen was like, let's get Starbucks at 6 p.m. Because <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> no, no kidding. I, this is what I'm like 24 seven. People laugh about that all the time that I'm just up and loud. But I think, you know, Choir people especially tend to be like that. So that's probably yes, not a yeah. surprise to you guys. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to assume to start that you have very little background knowledge on what it would take to start and run um, a show choir. So if it ends up being a little bit like basic at the beginning. Don't worry, I will add more to it for you. But I want to make sure if this is your first foray into this, you get a lot of information. So the book itself, which I, I pulled off my shelf so I could like hold it good, up. Good, 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 good. Pretty you guys. Um, the book is so it also so smooth. For those of you who like have it at your house, like does anybody else just, no, it's just me that pets it probably. But it's um it's got a lot of information, like I'm saying tonight for beginner stuff. There are three main sections to the book. The first part is a lot about um, the why we do what we do of the section. So there's a lot of social emotional learning context and things like that in there. The middle section of the book is the what's. So it's a lot of the things that are happening and what you should be focused on and, and what you should be doing. And then I really wanted to be sure when I was creating this book that there was an entire component that was kind of more like a how to because I think that's really what's missing out in show choir universe as far as information goes where you can just open the resource and go, okay, I need information about 
how to order a number line, like, and then that's in here. So the third section really is a lot more of a reference section of the book. Um, so it certainly can be used as that, but you can also sit down and read it as, as you're reading like a nonfiction book as well. It works that way as too. So today, like I said, I'll go through the basics of presenting some things to know when you're getting started. And then feel free to throw questions in the chat, like even now, if, you, if there's something that you're like, hey, go back and tell me more about that. I'm happy to do that. So please put that in there. That's what this is for. Don't feel weird about that at all. So let me share my screen with y'all here. And I'm reading where you guys are from and all of that as I'm doing that. Okay. Thank you for those of you who are saying what age group you have. That helps us a lot too. Um, because the book is really geared towards not just high school, but it's middle school and high school. We want to make sure it's friendly to directors of both of those because that is what we have a lot of the time all right i'm presenting it in the least glamorous way ever not in the whole like oh i can make it full screen for you we'll make it full screen for you all right so this is how i this is one of my presentations that i've been doing um this season around the country at very days and so i'm just going to a truncated version of this for you, but it's got a lot of great information in it. Plus, I really like how bright and sunny it is because it's got all the oranges on it and it makes me think of summer and the end of summer. <laughs> so um, we talk about show choir as being like a boost to your program. So we're talking about it being like a vitamin SC in this when we're trying to catch your attention and think about a way to remember it. So you give yourself that like injection of like that, that life into your program when you have this, it gives you so many opportunities and ways to connect with your mm -hmm. kids that are harder to do in our standard concert settings. You know, I say that as a director myself, sometimes we're so focused on, it's, I'm in Texas, I don't know how many, if we talked about that at the beginning, but if you know anything about Texas choral music, you know, we are very serious into our competitive concert choir things that happen in the spring. Um, sometimes it's called district music contest, sometimes it's called large contest in other states, but in Texas it's called UIL, which stands for, are you ready for this? University Intergalactic League, which sounds like a spaceship <laughs> to me, but um, that is the umbrella that we compete under. So I think a lot of times, especially where I am in Texas, we get really focused on <clears throat> knowing that that concert choir competitive thing is coming up. And we spend all year focused on teaching them how to sight read really, really effectively because that's part of what we compete in. And then we're working towards these, you know, three pieces of literature being really, really well worked out. So often we don't take time to, I don't know, it sounds cheesy, but I always think about it as stop and smell the roses. Like we don't spend a lot of time on social emotional learning, or we don't spend a lot of time on just the fun of music. I don't know about y'all, but I want my kids to leave my programs and like have enjoyed it. You know, Brian was talking at the beginning, how Brian was a show choir kid, and he can talk to you still about the stuff that he loves and remembers from that time. Like, that's what we want. We want them to go out in their real lives. You know, it's not like you're still competing and performing in show choir, but you remember it and that's important. So let's talk about first what show choir is and it's bare bones basics. Um, traditionally, it's a mid-size ensemble. I don't give an exact number of kids because it really does vary based on where you are in the country. The larger side is sometimes up in the 70s. Like you'll have groups that have 70 children on stage. Um, there are even some groups, a couple in Iowa that I have in mind in particular, Ankeny Centennial will have like in the 90s of children on stage. That makes my brain want to fall out of my head. Uh, if their director were here, he'd tell you the same thing. But they are a no cut school, which means that they okay. have to have, if a child wants to be in the ensemble, they have to accommodate that. So I don't know how many they have right now. I think they have... I don't think they have six anymore. I think they have five groups for sure at the high school level. And they have to have that many kids because they're not allowed to cut. So that's a huge, crazy number, right? Some of you are in your minds going, no, ma'am. And I'm not asking you to do that. So mid-size ensemble usually means somewhere in the 30s to 40s, maybe 50 on the high side. Less than 30 does tend to make it a little harder to fill up uh, the room with sound the way that we do with a live band also being our backup. So it's not to say that you can't have less than 30. You absolutely can. My first group in Texas had 16. Um, and then the next year we had 24. You know, that's how this works. You just grow over time. So start with what you have. No one's saying not that. But, you know, a good goal is somewhere around 40. Somewhere in there is a great number if you can get that or even high 30s. Oftentimes it's a mixed group. Um, a lot of the times we'll even do SAB music, especially if it's a newer group or even just two part, because when you add in the component of movement on top of the vocal component, um, 
something's going to suffer, you know, something's going to be a little bit harder to keep going. So you want the vocal quality to still be good. And so it's, easier to thin out the number of parts that you have versus we're going to do SATB with 20 kids and everyone's going to dance like a maniac and you won't be able to hear us at all. <laughs> like That's not a deal. So um, oftentimes mixed. Sometimes we do have single gendered groups. Um, they often compete in a single gendered category. It's more common to have uh, treble groups, of course, because there are always more girls in choir. But um, in the last decade, especially, there's been kind of a a growing pattern of tenor bass show choirs, which is like, I gotta be honest with you, my favorite thing ever. Like if you could go watch a tenor bass show choir, why would you not? That sounds like the most fun thing ever. Also some of them have names like testosterone and that's just the funniest thing ever to me, but um, they are do competing in a different category from mixed groups. And if you are starting from scratch and let's say you really only have like, you have 15 girls and two boys who are interested. I get that question a lot. Like, do I take the two boys or not? And my answer is always, how teachable do you feel like they are? If you feel like they really wanna be a part of this and really wanna do it, absolutely take them. If you think they're just there to learn, sort of fill in a schedule or something, maybe find a way for them to like work crew or to travel with you in some other capacity to help build up the, the tenor base numbers that you have. Um, and yes, we, tr we are working in show choir world to remove the gender titles from them. And we're saying tenor bass and, and, uh, soprano alto more often now. Um, but they used to be called unisex categories and you will still see that sometimes. Um, so, and then of course we just talked about this, it's both singing and dancing at the same time, which I think we all know, but a lot of us grew up, if you're my age, which is, um, I graduated from high school in the nineties. So if you are that age or older, I think a lot of us, what we saw in show choir is what we would now call more like swing choir or a pop performance group, but show choir itself really nowadays, when you're using that title, it generally means this stage setup that we're talking about in the next bullet point with the four riser platforms up on the stage. And then there's a live band of some sort behind the risers accompany you. That is a true show choir setup. Um, if it's a CD player or what am I saying? This is two, 2021. Um, if it's like an MP3 or whatever playing your music in the background for you, that's not necessarily a show choir unless you're at the middle school level, in which case most middle schools um, in a lot of parts of the country use recorded accompaniment and that's fine. So you just kind of need to check with your state and people around you and see what the norm is in that capacity. Um, standard accompaniment beyond it just being a live band, you, you have piano, drums, bass, um, and then those are the three standard. If you've got those three, you can have live accompaniment. Um, beyond that, synths are great. Synthesizers are awesome. And uh, brass sections specifically are the things that you want to search for. Sometimes there are students that are um, your band members, and that's ideal if you can get kids who can do it. What a cool experience you're giving them, teaching them how to gig, you know? Um, some states require that, some don't. So again, you need to kind of just check with people around you. And if people around you aren't doing it yet, and you're not sure who to ask. If you ask me, I know pretty much someone in most states, so I could find out for you if you want to know. Um, and then the next set down there, that third bullet point says a five song set is standard. I say that because that has historically been what people do, um, at least over in the last 20 years, for sure. We're seeing a lot more um, situations where groups are doing uh, a lot more songs, but much shorter, where they're like a minute long, under two minutes long, and they're doing like eight songs as opposed to five songs that are each three minutes or less. So that tide is kind of changing, which gives you a little bit more freedom and flexibility with how you want to run that. But five songs is standard. Right now, coming out of COVID, I have a lot of groups, especially in Texas, that I've encouraged that I work with to do maybe just four, um, do fewer, better than doing a whole bunch sort of okay while we're retraining our kids as to like how to do things and how things work. So same goes if you're just starting out, um, there'd be nothing wrong with doing an up-tempo opener, a ballad where they stand and sing and an up-tempo closer. That's a whole show. You don't have to have five, um, but we just say five is standard. And your shows generally run between 13 and 16 minutes. It can be shorter. Uh, there's no rule that says it can't be, but most competitions have a time limit um, where you can't go longer than 25 or 30 minutes, depending upon the competition. So you'll want to ask that question. And that is door to door. From the moment your kids step on stage, you get everything set up, you do your show, you tear everything down. So um, be sure to check that. If you have any ex experience or knowledge of marching band world, it's very similar in that way to how marching band works. 
Um, the last bullet point here talks about how it is usually nowadays a competitive ensemble. It does, it's not to say that show choirs can't exist without competing, of course they can, um, but a lot of times nowadays uh, they are competing. And I'm looking at a lot of your states here that I'm seeing in the chat, and I've got a lot of you who are places like Ohio and uh, the upper Midwest. Those types of locations definitely have large competitive circuits, so it would be very easy for you to compete there. And again, if you're wanting to do that and you're just not sure what's in your area, shoot me an email and I'll happily point you in the direction of some more resources, or I can tell you from firsthand knowledge what I know. Um, I've got a couple little videos here I want to share with you of just some different groups. Um, these directors know I'm sharing, but they don't know I'm sharing on a webinar. Good luck, guys. All right, so this is uh, the first one I'm showing you today. And let me fix my screen share here while I'm doing this so I don't screw it up. Uh, is a group called the Amazing Technicolor Show Choir. How's that for a fun name? And they are from um, Omaha, Nebraska. And they were one of the first competitive groups in Nebraska. I'm from there, so I have a, a great affinity for, for the Cornhusker State. And the director there, Doran Johnson, has been there for many, many years. And this was in 2020 before everything shut down. And this was their Olympics show because there was supposed to be Olympics that in 2020. <laughs> and uh, their director likes to say how uh, his show was the only Olympics that happened actually in 2020. So let me share this with you guys. This is ATSC and their opener from their Olympic show. Can you feel it? The spirit surrounds you. Won't you feel it? And now that it's found you. Won't you feel it? The feeling's everywhere. Can you feel it here? Now the moment we waited for is coming true. Is coming true. I uh, know like most of that show I could do the whole thing with you. <laughs> it was one of those that I judged a bunch and clanked a bunch so I've seen it many many times but um Anytime, by the way, we're listening to show choir videos, if you want to go on YouTube and go down a rabbit hole about it, keep in mind that audio is always very strange when you're listening to recorded large groups like that, because they're not really meant to be mic'd in that way. You know, you're getting an alto who passes a microphone like every three counts. And so it's a really loud, like random voices. It's usually much better um, mixed than that when you're there live and in person. So uh, if that feels a little strange, just keep that in mind. But they're always a great group I love to give as, as examples because they do a great job of what I would call classic show choir you know the the splashy dresses and the big fanfare of the music and that kind of stuff like they're really great at capturing that really beautiful traditional spirit of show choir and they do a lot of contemporary work as well um, but that is a great example if you're just starting out you want to show your kids something um, that feels uh, not only like something to aspire to but also also achievable. Like I, I feel like Doran does a great job of mixing those things and making it audience friendly. You can look them up on YouTube and pull any of their stuff to show your kids. That's always a great, a great group to start with. Um, the next one here that I've got, I need to reshare my screen for you here, is um, this is just a little bit of information about kind of the reasons that make sense to interval screen, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, that uh, you get out of having a show choir on your campus. So if you need to explain it to like an administrator or a parent group as to like why this is important, or if you're even just trying to sell it to yourself still, <laughs> um, an important thought, these three thoughts I think really kind of encapsulate most of what I feel like you get out of show choir. Pop music can be used as a tool to teach stylized singing and harmonies. And I think that that has been overlooked in a lot of ways in our profession in the last few decades. Um, a lot of us got just really married to that traditional American choral music sound. And that, not that there's anything wrong with that, but there are a lot of forms of music that were uh, written to be sung and performed differently than that. And Shokar gives us the opportunity to explore pop and musical theater, contemporary musical theater, um, folk, all those genres that are closely related to what our kids consume in their daily lives but that maybe we're not really exploring in our core classrooms. So it gives you the opportunity to do that. It also really helps you teach weird, complex rhythmic patterns and intervals that you don't necessarily hear as often in choral music, even in contemporary choral music. So that's a really great, that's a really great administrator curriculum answer there for if you need a reason to explain why this is important. Um, the next one there, it gives your program an ensemble that uses widely 
widely known commercial music because in most cases it's going to be recognizable commodities that you're that you're choosing for your shows um that's not to say you shouldn't find obscure pop music you should go searching and find something cool that you can teach your kids to like that's awesome uh find things that you like and bring it to their attention that's always good too um but you know audiences are drawn in when they feel connected to the music and you're giving them an easy way to be connected because it's things they've heard on the radio now or maybe when they were in high school. And so it helps put uh, butts in the seats, so to speak, for lack of a better term, um, when you are having any performance at your school. If they are hooked into knowing, hey, I saw them when they did the show choir and I loved it, they're more likely to come to your fall concert. And then thirdly, the social emotional connection that show choir basically builds almost just on its own. You, you really don't even have to do a lot with it for that to exist, um, is so important in today's world. And when I wrote that information a few years ago when I was talking about this and it's in my book, we hadn't even dealt with what we're dealing with now with the pandemic and, and the isolation a lot of kids have felt and the very strange way we've had to try and create music over the last year. Um, we need a little bit more social emotional connection in our lives and the kids do too. So having an ensemble like this where they really feel bonded because they are all working super hard together at something they weren't sure they could achieve because I got news for you. Most of your kids are like, you want me to dance? What? <laughs> and so when they finally get that, Oh, they're so proud and they have that connection because they went through it together. So those are the three main things I think you really can get out of it. And then the next few slides just give us a little bit more info on all of those in depth. Um, again, this is kind of the slide for your admin or your curriculum coordinators, um, the higher ups that need those like big words to explain why this is important. <laughs> so stylized vocals, obviously it's important when you're doing uh, anything that's outside of a choral genre that's written specifically for choral music, let's say. Um, it's important to know what the source material is, is the term that we use for that. So uh, I'm going to take a super pop stance here and we're just going to go out the window and say Dua Lipa. Okay, so if you're doing a song by Dua Lipa, who's a contemporary pop artist, right, um, it would be actually inappropriate for us to overly choralize the sound of whatever song it is. Um, as much as I think that's what we were maybe taught to do, a lot of us, again, when we were first teaching and, and doing pop music, um, there's a level of where it has to be altered a little bit because they're singing in a group. And so that's understandable. But there is a fine line between making sure it works in a group and taking it and changing it and making it, you know, palatable as a choral piece. That's not what we should be doing. Um, it needs to still ring true to the original content, to the source material. And that's coming up more and more in choral music um, all over what we do. And so this is a good way to remind ourselves of that when we're working inside of that. Um, and it really just has to do with the shape um, and placement of the sound, which we'll talk about on the next slide, to really make it be choral, but still ring true to its pop roots or its contemporary musical theater roots. The next one here talks about ear training. <laughs> excuse me, we deal a lot in ear training in Texas, like I said, because we um, are judged on sight reading when we go, and I know a lot of your states are too. So we definitely want to work ear training, right? Getting these kids to hear something and then translate it into like what they see on the page and make it work together. That's, that's such a cool skill. You're really teaching them something that way. Um, because usually when we give them standard choral music, uh, concert choir music, they often don't know it. They're learning it from the page. This is the reverse of that. A lot of times they do know it, and they're having to reverse engineer it to being a choral piece. And I think that there's a lot they can learn from that. Thirdly, sight reading. Obviously, the more we read, the better we get. So you're just giving your kids another chance to read more sheet music. Honestly, if you need a basic way to explain why this is important, nothing wrong with that. And then lastly, they really become better musicians because of it. We know that that kind of goes hand in hand with that sight reading component of the more they read, the better they get. Well, the more music they're exposed to, the better musicians they're going to be. The more experiences they have to pull from when they're performing. And ultimately, I think that that should be one of our goals. And it probably is one of your goals. So that's a, these are four really great reasons to implement it. And like I said, more of the muckety-muck admin reasons why you need to implement it. Um, let's talk really quickly about um, placement and shape for uh, show choir, because I think this is one of the top reasons why directors uh, shy away from doing it. They feel like they maybe don't understand how to make that work, and maybe they're a little scared off by it. Maybe they didn't do it themselves in high school. So when I travel to clinic, I teach this very simple concept, uh, which is really just a very dumbed down version of teaching IPA. Um, because I need these kids to all be on board with the concept really quickly so I can make changes. Excuse me, I'm going to clear my throat real quick. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so we have on the left side of your screen, um, you'll recognize the very familiar IPA chart that probably most of us dealt with in college or at any given time in our in our teaching. So I have highlighted the two shaping things that are most common that we use, which is a close shaping, not closed, close, remember. And the way I explain that to kids is if you think about if you're pulling the corners of your lips kind of close together and you're your lips up a little bit, um, when it was, you know, closer to the 90s, I used to say to the kids, you puck your lips like this, and most of them would know that's from The Little Mermaid. Kids don't know anything nowadays. So anyway, you're pulling your lips together and you kind of pucker them out a little bit. That's a close shape, okay? And then when you're doing an open shape, it's more relaxed. Your, your corners of your mouth are not close together. Therefore, they are open. It does not mean hyperextend your jaw open. I think we all learned that in the 90s and now we know better. But those are very general concepts of what close and open look like. Trust me that they don't need a lot more information than that to make this work. So start there before you over explain what close looks like and open looks like and just stop there. The next part of this is where it's placed, where the sound is coming from. Now we know a little bit more about pedagogy than probably our kids do. And then we also tend to know a little bit more about the biology of how it works in our body without getting too far into here's your vocal cord and here's a slide of somebody's scoped mouth, you know, which is a thing that we see a lot. Um, Cause again, I don't usually have time for that when I'm traveling. And sometimes I find that that's off putting to kids. Um, when you're at home with them, do whatever you need to do, teach it however you need to teach it. But if you're just trying to quickly get the thought across, this works really well. So one is if you put your pointer finger kind of back by, you know, how we used to say, open your jaw and you can feel a hole there, kind of back in that area, that's one. Two is if you put your middle finger on your cheekbone, like the, the apples of your cheeks, the rosy part here. And three is when you put your ring finger up by that corner of your mouth, okay? And I have the kids touch their face, which you have to decide with COVID and all that, how you're gonna handle that if that doesn't work for you. But I like to have them touch their face because it actually helps them feel it better where the sound is quote coming from. Now, is the sound literally coming from here when you sing with that placement? No, we know that, but this is giving them kind of that feeling of that. We call this, you know, layman's placement, right? So when we are singing something, I'll give them an example. And then you want them to try various placements and shapes just to see what works. It's a really like a guess and check way of doing it. Um, Oh, I can't push my through. This is from um, this is from Greatest Showman, and it's just that classic iconic line at the beginning of the movie where they whoa, right? It's just that interval. So if we were in a room together, I'd have you sing this with me. But the example is, I'll I'll demonstrate for you. And I'm sorry again, remember I tell all day, so let's not judge my voice today. But the point is, you want to pick combinations of placement and shapes that are going to be weird to start because it helps them understand why that doesn't work. And as soon as why they know what doesn't work, it's actually way easier for them to identify what is going to work. So if we're doing, in this case, pop contemporary musical theater, right? The odds that the placement is going to be as far back as one, it's pretty low, right? And the odds that the shape is going to be close is probably not good either. So that's the one I'm going to have them start with, right? I usually let them yell out numbers, pick a number, pick a shape and they're like one and close and you're like okay here we go and so we sing it together and it's like Ooh, and they just laugh especially if you have middle schoolers because they're like well that's insane obviously that's wrong duh <laughs> and that's good they get this moment of that light bulb going off of oh that's that's not great and then you get to say the super smart choir thing which is but is there a time where that is the appropriate sound we want and they'll go yeah when we sang last year for contests we did you know that's sea shanty and that's the way we did it. Okay, you're right. Sometimes that is the appropriate shape and placement, but not for this song. So it's a great teaching moment for you. And then you work your way through until everybody kind of gets to a place where they're like, well, it should be open. And it's probably one or two. And you go, ah, you're like, oh, that sounds like the original. And you very quickly identified how to narrow down what the sound should be and unified it for your kids. You're not just out there being like, make it sound brighter, which is a great term, but it's kind of generic and doesn't always mean the same thing to every kid. So you've taught them how to identify what that feels like now. Um, I've got another quick example for you here. Let me stop my share and fix it. This one is from a group that I am just, I mean, could not be more obsessed with. This is Wabonzi Valley. They are in the Chicago area. Um, so those of you who are local to Chicago, next time we have live show party, we go watch them. Uh, they, um, 
this during this time, this is 2013. So their director at this time was uh, someone named Mark Myers. He has done doctoral work at UCLA and is now um, doing artistic direction for Chicago Children's Chorus. And um, incredible, incredibly smart choral musician. But uh, this is his group from 2013. The show was called uh, Simple Gifts. And so I've given you a little smittering here of the opener in which they sing Simple Gifts, the traditional um, song. And then they're also their second number, which is a gospel piece. And you're going to hear them change their shape and their placement during like the song even. That's one of my favorite examples of this. Here we go. This is Wabonzi Valley. Listen to how light and beautiful and it floats. It's very appropriate to the style. Now they're doing a Bollywood song. So like in the middle of the chord structure, they change the placement and it becomes a completely different sound, right? <laughs> second number this is uh the gospel piece it's by kirk franklin it's called should have been me or could have been me excuse me much more contemporary, much brighter than he's gonna rap right now. So it's a completely different vibe. And those songs ran back to back against each other in a show. Um, that's just one of my favorite parts about show choirs is how in one five song set, you could like hit all of these different genres, all of these different styles of vocal. Like it's hard to do that in our regular programming because our curriculum is often not structured for that. So what a cool thing that you have the opportunity to do that. Um, the next one here that we have is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make it full screen again for you. you there it is. Um, so talk about community involvement real quickly. Um, music literacy is declining rapidly. It's pretty scary, the statistics, if you want to look some of them up right now. Um, various studies have been done, of course, they're doing those all the time. But in recent years, um, the literacy rate is in some cases expected to be as low as 21% in the next few years. That means there are adults that we had in the classroom as children who took music, who have forgotten enough that they are no longer considered music literate by the time they get to adulthood. And why is that? Like what is happening during their music experience that they're not continuing to grow with that as adults or continuing to remember that or care about it even? Um, I think that's interesting. And I think we need to keep that in our forefront about how we can keep not only kids in our programs, but as the next two parts here say, how can we keep the parents and the community involved in what we're doing in our music programs? Um, people can't learn if they're not present. So if the work that we're doing is in any way like just completely alienating our community, meaning a lot of times, a lot of us work in communities, I certainly have, where people feel threatened by like 
classical music or they feel like you know it's snooty or you know the, all those strange words that people use and we're like it's just western european art song i don't know what to tell you but people feel that way about it so we need to also work to not just provide that sort of music for people but we also need to work to meet our communities where they are with their music literacy and pop music is often a great way to bring people in meeting them with what they hear on the radio and bringing them in and then hitting them with something else like simple gifts, for example, right? Or bringing them in and then hitting them with Eric Whitaker as your ballad. You know, there's so many cool ways to kind of do that bait and switch even is kind of the way I call it. Um, and that's what this slide is about. This is one of my favorites. Um, I'll leave it up here while I talk so you can kind of look, but this is examples of three community members I've had in the past and things they've said to me. Um, the one on the left, this is my favorite booster dad I've ever had. Uh, he was a beer distributor, so he was probably everyone's favorite booster dad, <laughs> but he um, came up to me one day and was like, I'm so glad uh, you know, my daughter's doing choir because it's nice to just look at something and listen to something without staring at my phone sometimes. <laughs> and he meant it in the nicest way, but I was also like, thank you, question mark. <laughs> but again, we were meeting him where he was with his love of the music he loves. And we were bringing him in and he started to enjoy all events we were doing, all choral events we were doing. The middle one, everybody has a grandma Vicky in their program, right? Somebody's grandma who's everything she says is slightly mean, but she's trying to like pay you a compliment. And so she comes up to me one day and she goes, these kids are less boring every time I see them. Great job, teach. I mean, I, I was like 25 at the time. I was like, I don't know what to think. Is she mad at me? I did, it took me like days to realize she wasn't mad but and she wasn't being sarcastic she was being serious um and she, that was her way of saying hey I'm engaged I'm enjoying being here actually I'm involved in what's happening and then the one on my right is my favorite when you get a younger sibling who comes up to you after a concert it's like I want to do that I want to be there I want to be what they're doing and you know you've got them like hooked for life oh, that's like my favorite and I know you feel that too so that's just some examples of those th things and you know that I don't need to share that with you but um the last little video experience that I was going to show you I'm watching my time here so I make sure I don't blow past what we're trying to do um is one of my own groups I spent three years uh in the last five up in Mitchell South Dakota where I was working with um Mitchell Friend of Coup, which if you know about the upper Midwest or Midwest of Show Choir, um, they're pretty competitive in that area. They've been around for a very long time. They've been competing since the 80s, which is pretty long in Show Choir world. And um, this group of kids was my very first group for the first year that I was there. And if you've ever, you know, started somewhere, which you all have, you know that it can be hard to draw kids in. And you just don't know what that first year is going to be like. It could be really scary. Um, but these kids really jumped in and, you know, got on board with excuse me, me as a director and the show we wanted to do. And I'm showing you this because you can hear and see the community involvement because this is our home show at our own competition. And you've never experienced anything as exciting and crazy like being a rock star until you have performed at your home competition where you're not competing. And so everyone who's there, you were like their room host all day and they're in love with you now. And they're so happy to watch you perform. Like it's the greatest moment. So watch your the community involvement. And see. applause after songs is generally louder and longer um you have to hold for that like you have to wait and read the audience the kids have to wait and then you bring the band in when the applause starts to fall it's kind of a cool experience if you've never done it that way before oh did i skip it yeah this is their ballad <laughs> one dad in the back is like yeah <laughs> like somebody's dad is like 
really excited. But that's actually normal in Shokwara Universe because it's competitive. So it's a lot more like a sporting event. And we actually encourage that as long as you're not yelling over their singing too much so the judges can't hear them and people can't enjoy, we want there to be applause in those moments. The kids feed off of that. And that's different than our standard concerts as well. So that's something to know. Uh, this was the loudest cheer in that show. Seven thirty at night, people are just losing their minds. Like it's the greatest feeling. So, I mean, how can you watch that and not want to give your kids that experience, right? And no matter what you're doing, even if it's your first year and you got fifteen kids on stage, that will be the reaction from your audience. I assure you, because anytime you add the movement to it, people are like, "This is incredible! <laughs> what are you doing? How are you doing that?" So, you're giving your kids the opportunity to feel like rock stars, which is pretty darn cool, actually. All right, the last little section here is about the social emotional learning. Um, so when they're on stage together, of course, you've got that great picture there. That's another one of my years at Mitchell. Um, they're really building, they're forging this bond because they are communicating with each other in that moment live. And while we strive for that in the concert setting, I think, it's sometimes harder to replicate because of the way we need to stand or the way we need to be placed or like the, the restrictions of the event or whatever we're singing or however the traditional uh, standing works and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it keeps us from having that connection on stage. Sometimes it keeps them from really having that communication with each other. But here, I mean, if you look through that picture right there of them all together, you can see lots of little moments where they're making eye contact with each other. You can see that kid is looking at that kid and like they have these times, they build that into the show where they're like, oh, this is the, this is the change moment where I go from position A to position B and I always like high five Marcus on my way by, you know, something like that. They build that in for themselves. You don't have to tell them to do that. They get these great connections. And then those are the people they rely on all year. Those are the people that, who are their friends. Those are the people who you know hold them up when they're having a rough day. You have built them a support system just by having this program exist. And that's why I get so passionate about wanting people to start it. Vulnerability is the way you get art. And so often we take that away from our kids, not on purpose, but just because we're trying to get the work done because we're trying to get the curriculum done. Something like this, where you're putting them out of their shell, where you're, they're dancing, they're wearing costumes. It takes them so far outside their box, generally their comfort zone that you are creating vulnerability. And then therefore that art ends up being just so incredible and such a neat thing to be a part of. Uh, I know a lot of what you've seen today and what we talked about today is, is high school, um, but all of this works with middle school as well. Texas, especially uh, in my area, has many, many middle school groups that, um, that compete and that do this. You just have to be smart about taking the information and making it appropriate to whatever grade level you're teaching, which is how we do our concert programming anyway. So it would be the same in that capacity. I want to also be sure to say that the number one question I get from directors is, um, about just the movement component is, how do you teach them to dance like that? A, I do not teach them to dance like that. That's what choreographers are for. <laughs> I do not do that part. There are people who choreograph and direct their groups. Um, it's less common than it used to be. Nowadays, most people hire out a choreographer. And if, you, again, you need help finding a choreographer in your area or the one that could work with you that you think will fit your needs, ask people around you and look at the groups they're doing or find a group you love and be like, who's their choreographer? Or email me and I'll be happy to like go, yeah, here's who I know works in your area. Or you wanna bring in somebody from out of state? Great, here's a list of people that are awesome. Um, this slide that I have up here for you that's kind of on pause is just some retreat activities. But if you're not having a retreat and you have a show choir, I encourage you to do that. It's a great way to build in those social emotional concepts um, and really help those kids bond because the sooner they feel connected, the faster they get to doing the cool work of creating that art on stage. Um, so all of these can be found on my site as well, which is showcollective.com. Uh, since it's August, I didn't even plan this when we planned this was going to be the webinar time, but I always open a, a learning cohort, a year long learning cohort. It opens twice a year. One is in April, one is in August. And if you join it, you get a full year of resources that you can use for your group. Um, and it's, you either pay a one-time fee or you can pay monthly for it, but it allows you to, um, 
download a lot of these examples and there are video things that you can use in there as well, which is super, super cool. Um, video warmups, there's mindfulness exercises, there's journaling exercises, and it's built by the month. So like right now, if you were to join, you would get all the August materials and all the August materials are things that you would be doing in August. So it's really built to match your school year and the infinite shofar calendar, which is also on the site and you can download that for free. Um, so this is just four of those retreat examples that I do and I can tell you more about them if you're curious or like I said, you can go on the site and learn more. Um, the, no, am I out of pages for you? That can't be, there is. Um, and then this I'll just leave up while I finish talking and we do question and answer. Um, obviously the book is on there, which you know about cause you're on GIA. Um, show collective is my main site for professional development resources for show choir directors. Um, and then the collective cohort is what I was just talking to you about now, which is the year long resources. Um, you can get the link for that from showcollective.com. but I do a lot of fun stuff on, um, on Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram or me, me or Show Collective, if you do that, uh, there's also a Facebook page for both of those things. Um, and then my website is there as well. So um, I wanna make sure I get a chance for you to ask questions. So take a couple seconds and kind of process if there's something that you want to ask or you really are, just feel like you need to know, that's great. Uh, it doesn't matter if you think that it's a weird question. Nothing is ever a weird question in show choir, I assure you. No matter how obscure, no matter how strange it seems to you. Um, while you're typing, I'm gonna answer some of the most common questions that we get. We talked about how A, I don't make the choreography, you hire a choreographer. B, one of the most common questions I get is about kids changing clothes. How do they do the changing of the clothes backstage? And the answer is simply that they change clothes backstage. Generally, if um, they're younger, you split them up by um, having whatever their uh, identified gender is, as the only people backstage at that time. Um, and they're always wearing appropriate undergarments that help cover things and that kind of stuff. But they do, they just change backstage. And there's usually a curtain that kind of hides that area. So that answers that. Um, when you're talking about blocking, that's a common question, which is where the kids stand on stage. And you'll see blocking changes a lot. And again, if you know marching band world, um, it's very similar to that. We have a, uh, a, an app actually that a, a good friend of mine, Alex Hall, created that's called Stagebook. Um, and you can go to the app store and type in Stagebook and find that. It's a one-time purchase fee, but it's built for your iPad and it's made so that you can set up what your stage looks like. And then you can type, there's a dot for each, you know, number of people that you have on stage. You type the kid's name in and you can move them around that way. You can actually write it, of course, on paper too, but, but that app is incredible. So I highly recommend it. So that's what we do is we write out charts for where the kids are going to stand. And then it's also pretty common to have a number line. If you've ever looked at the front of a Broadway stage, for example, or a touring company, you'll notice that there's hash marks or numbers in certain spots at the front of the stage. We do that too. We just make sure ours is uh, travelable because we take them with us. So it's usually printed on vinyl sign material. And I can give you the dimensions that people use to give to sign companies to have them printed up. Um, some choreographers have a preference for how the numbers are represented. So if you have a choreographer and you want to do a number line, make sure you ask them, do they want it to be like even numbers or odd numbers? Because sometimes that matters. Um, and then the other common question that I get is just about personnel. So like, who do you hire as choreographers? I can give you a list, but that list is of course ever changing. And um, it just depends on the year. So it's not really written out anywhere because it, it's constantly evolving. But if you need to find one, um, talk to again, people in your area, or you can contact me and I'll ask you some questions about like, what's your group size? How long have you been around? What is your goals? And then I can give you a list of choreographers that I think might you know help with that. Same thing with um, arrangers and sheet music. Most sheet music for show choir is custom arranged. Um, not necessarily for middle school, it's often stock music for middle school, which means you're going to like somewhere like JW Pepper and, um, and you're purchasing from there. But, um, but there's oftentimes um, uh, custom arrangements happening for those kind of groups. So when you hear those songs and you're like, I love that, where did they find that? Someone probably wrote it for them directly. So if you're looking for arrangers, again, I can give you a list of that. Arrangers generally have, um, I shouldn't say generally, but a lot more of them have websites. So it's easier to, to work with them in that capacity, but I can send you more about that. Okay, so I'm looking over on our question panel list here. So the name of the app for um, placing them on stage is called Stage Book. 
stage, stage book. book. And I took, I took my iPad home uh, to work. So I can't show you. It's not, you can only put it on your iPad, um, but it's called stage book. And the little icon is an S and a B when you look for it. Um, you know what? I'll bet I could find it in the app store here and text it to Brian if he wants to throw, or I can maybe throw it in the chat real quick here. Um, but anyway, stage book and it's incredible. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, next question down is. We've got a few good questions from Peter, actually. Uh, the first one I think we can tackle, which is, is discussed in the book, I know, is about fundraising and budgeting for a competitive yes. group. Yes. And that is also a top question, obviously. So it, it absolutely varies. Um, you can do it on a very small budget. The most expensive components usually are the personnel. So like that and costuming are the two things that people usually spend quite a bit of money on. Choreographers vary in their pricing. It very much depends upon how much experience they have, how many years they've been doing it, how many groups they have. Um, some of the brand new, you know, I always call them baby choreographers. They, you know, just graduated. They're just starting out. Sometimes they'll do things for like 300 a song, let's say, right? Um, and don't quote me on that. That's not a thing that you can always go to say people, Jen said it would be 300 a song. No, it varies by person. So 300 a song is kind of a low end. Um, but when you get up into the people who've been doing it like 20 years and they have these highly competitive national ranking groups, um, you're paying them multiple thousands of dollars for sure to do your show. Um, and choreography is very much you get what you pay for in most cases. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, choreographers tend to have to travel from somewhere. And so you have to factor in the costs of having them stay somewhere as well and, and how the, all of that works. So that becomes the most expensive part, I feel like. And, and that's the part you can't really change. Uh, otherwise, beyond that, costuming wise, there are very affordable costuming options throughout our universe of show choir. Um, Gail McKinnis Productions is who I work with most often, um, which you can Google her real quick, Brian, if you want to, Gail McKinnis Productions. Um, but she, for example, is someone who you can say, I need a dress. I want it to be purple. I'd like it if it were flowy at the bottom. I only have 10 girls and I can only spend $150 per girl. And Gail would be like, Da, 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 and she'll have it like drawn up for you. And she'll be like, what do you think of this? And you can go, that's great. So like with, and, and most customers will do that for you. I just bring her up because I've used her for forever, but um, you can say, this is my budget per child. I can't go over X amount of money. Um, and so once you've paid for costuming and the choreographer, that's the huge expense because you don't have to use a custom arranger. You can buy stock music and that does not have to end up being crazy expensive. Um, you know, publishers are more often doing more with instrumentation for pop music because they know we're using these for show choirs. So you can definitely go like, again, onto like a JW Pepper type site and filter it down. Choral music, pop music needs to have instrumentation. And boom, you'll have like 50 different things you can do there. And that will help you save money too. From a fundraising standpoint, the book does have a lot of options in there for you if you want to look at that. Um, but my favorite fundraisers are performance-based fundraisers. Somebody super smart early in my career told me, have your kids earn money the way that they, with the thing that they do best. So like we perform. So like, let's see if we can earn money that way. So some of the performance fundraisers I've done in the past is kids camp is super lucrative generally. It's where you run a one day camp for like third through sixth graders or second through seventh graders, whatever, to the younger group of kids. Um, if you're a high school and you have them come up and they learn like two songs and they have snacks with the high school kids. And then they put on a show at the end of the day, or they're the opening act at your premiere night or something like that. And the kids pay to come to that camp. Um, you can easily make, you know, a few thousand dollars very quickly on a day like that. Uh, so kids camp is a great one. Hosting your own invitational is a very common way to make a lot of money in show choir universe. Um, you're, you're easily making, once it starts rolling, most events are making somewhere between eight and $20,000 per event. Um, and that generally comes from ticket sales more than anything. That's where you're making the bulk of that money. So again, it's audience money that you're helping raise. Um, when you nickel and dime fundraisers, not that that's a bad thing, but sometimes groups will be like, oh, I did 15 car washes and my kids are totally burnt out. Well, you need to look at the risk reward benefit there, kind of like a business. If you're only making $2,000 in these 15 events, but you could host a kid's camp and make $2,000, stop doing this other one move more to doing those sort of performance things. So really be aware of how much you're working your kids to earn this money. And I know this sounds insane, um, but 
if you're allowed to charge money, you are probably able to charge more than you think you are. Most groups are undercharging their kids. And I know that sounds insane. Like lady, you don't know my kids. No, I, I understand that. But I have also taught in rural and low income areas where I have been like, I'll do 75 per child. And I'm freaked out. And they're like, we're used to paying 800. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. So like, <laughs> be sure that you're, you're looking at what other activities on your campus are charging is my point. If you are able to charge. And I know some states and some schools are not able to do that. And that's fine too. But I'm looking over on the chat here and Peter talked about doing an all night rehearsal I'm obsessed with that idea. I love that. Again, it's something your kids were going to do anyway. And you've added this fun lock-in element to it, right? That's a great way for your kids to make money. Um, sponsorships from different businesses or individuals. Everybody calls grandma and grandpa and they each donate a hundred bucks. Like things like that, that don't take too terribly long um, can quickly can quickly earn you quite a bit of money. Um, I'm looking at Brian to make sure I don't end up missing anything important in that sequence of fundraising. There was a couple good questions. We've got a a few good questions. Uh, maybe we'll just kind of like do a speed round, Jen, if that's possible. I know there's a million things to say. Um, okay, I'm preparing one was story. standard equipment for a competitive group, which you already, okay. you already have mentioned. to have risers. That part's really it, crucial. If you're going to compete somewhere, you, mm -hmm. if you have a smaller group can start with three rows of four across, and they are usually from stage right or winger. It is the eight foot by four foot platform risers. And if okay. you call a winger or stage right rep, I like stage right, you call them and you go, I need a show choir. I'm, I'm starting a show choir. This is what I want. They'll know what you need. So you can start with three if you have smaller, otherwise four by four is standard, four across, four back. Um, that's the only main equipment you would need to purchase. Um, usually you have pianos and instruments because we are schools with <laughs> those right. programs. So that would be that. Um, and the same, and the same question from Peter was about um, rules for arranging. So, and and okay. also copyright. I think is a you big put, conversation. You put the T word out there, which is Traysona. If you don't know about that, um, that is not a conversation I'm going to have on this webinar because it would be an entire other hour. Um, but you do need to be aware that if you are having something custom arranged, you need to ask for the rights to have that arranged. And there's often a payment that goes along with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you want to talk to me more in depth about that, shoot me an email and we can have a longer conversation about that because I will tell you that the rules for that are, are kind of gray. Um, you certainly should be doing it. Um, and Traysona is an easy way if you go to their website to, to upload the songs you're doing and have your arranger upload the sheet music and you pay for the rights and it's done. Um, but there's a lot of questions as to like, you know, who has the right to ask for fees? Who has the right to be charging and representing for you? So that's why I say it's a little bit of a gray area. Copyright law hasn't fully kind of kept up with all those things that are happening yet. Um, there's a lot to dive into there. But the, the short answer is yes, you should be asking for the rights if you are having something custom arranged. Your, your arranger will likely also know a lot about that too. And again, if you need more information from an arranger, let me know and I can send you some information there. And Jen, can you put your uh, email address in the chat? Oh, sure, sure, sure. We'll have that since you, you've mentioned it a couple of times. No, yes, I can do that. <laughs> uh, and then we have a good question uh, from, from Tony, which we'll get to here. Um, so Tony, well, let's see, they say they're just, any recommendations for start, for becoming a competitive group? The band director's okay. not necessarily on board with uh, the, the choir program turning into a competitive group, does it look like, what this looks like? Oh yeah, I'm seeing it right there, okay. Um, Okay. All right. So the first thing I would say is take your kids to one, not even to compete, just to watch. Um, mm -hmm. If they go see it and take parents, take as many chaperones as you can fit in that room. If you get the parents and the kids in an event, watching it happen, your job is done. Like they will do the work for you at that point. Cause they will start pushing the door down to make sure that you can have that and that they can be on that stage the next year. Show them a lot of videos as well. Also, like we always used to have movie Mondays and we'd just like show a group and we'd talk about it and like talk about why it was fun, but get them in the door at a competition is the best advice I can give you. Excellent. Oh, let's see. And then maybe we'll, we'll call this our last one here from Leanne. Show choir numbers dropped pretty drastically. A rough year, I know. 16 last year. Okay, great. Great. Oh, okay. okay. Awesome. Okay. So first of all, I don't know what you're dealing with, with voicing there, whether it's all SA or you've got a mixed group of SAB. Um, but I would suggest doing even with that size group, unison. 
Like don't overthink it, mix, thank you. Don't overthink it doing unison or because they're mixed two part, our choral director brains are like, ah, I would never do that without, you have to like erase what you would be doing for, you know, contest. Don't think of it that way. Think about the fact that you're gonna also ask them to be moving and remove a level of difficulty by removing some voice parts. So focus on getting them to feel successful in what they are doing. I would narrow it down to, like we said earlier, possibly only doing an opener, a ballad and a closer even, but just the three of them so that they can really, really feel great about the work that they did. And then I would bring in somebody to come work with them. Or I would maybe take them, if you're, I don't know if you're competing, it does, I'm looking to see if it says that specifically. If you're competing with them, still take them to competitions. Don't remove that element from their, from their existence because that will help you build them back up is the fact that they got to go and compete and they got to go do that. If you can take them to something special and you can bring special people in to work with them, giving them that special vibe time with just the 10 of them, um, I don't think you're gonna have any trouble growing it back up, but please know that you are not alone. Everyone in show choir world, everyone universally, no matter the size of your group, took weird hits this past year in the last couple of years because I mean, didn't we all? So don't feel like it's all hope is lost. Everyone is kind of weird right now is my point. So do what works for you and focus on giving them solid experiences they can feel good about. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. So I just kind of want to recap and just say that a, a lot of what Jen discussed uh, is, is mentioned in the book, of course, and including things that we didn't even have time to get through, get through in our short hour here. I mean, this is all things about selecting the appropriate music, how to find arrangers, choreographers, costuming, even choosing the right competitions for your group. There's a really great section in the book about, you know, how competitive uh, should the show be, uh, you know, proximity to where you're located. And there's a really great appendix, I think, uh, or at the end of the book, there's a, a yearly calendar of kind of what to expect for show choir in October versus February. What times of year are crazy? What times of year are? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's really, really helpful. Um, it's not a super long book. I think it really does a good job of just very kind of concisely giving you exactly what you need to know and covering those like you know, must have details about show choir. So I uh, can't recommend the book enough. Of course, Jen already mentioned that I'm a, you know, a show choir, uh, you know, alum myself, had a like great that. time, had a great time through that. And I'm really excited because there's just not a lot out there. I don't think in terms of resources for, for teachers who are in a situation where they have to teach show choir or right. want to be teaching show choir. And um, so we're just thrilled to, you know, have this book as part of our catalog um, so just a reminder that it's the promo code showchoir15, and I put the link to the, um, to the book uh, up there. And of course, I put Jen's website, showcollective.com, in the, in the chat. And of course, uh, Jen's email is also in there. I'll put my email, just in case anyone has any questions for me. It's just briang at giamusic.com. Um, but with that, I think we'll just uh, we'll wrap things up here. Thank you so much, Jen, for joining us here for this last hour. It has been a blast for me, and I'm certain it has been a blast for our attendees as well. Thank you to everyone who has attended. Oh, uh, and we'll we'll go ahead and get this reporting up on our uh, social media channels shortly. So with that, thank you to everyone, and have a wonderful night. And Jen, have a good rest of your week at school. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to go right. take a nap or bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I don't blame you. All right. See you, everybody. Bye, y'all.